Okay, so it's really, I'm honored to introduce you to Professor Paul Lawrence Rose. And before we begin, I would like to uh, publicly congratulate Professor Rose. He established a research center, the Center for Research on Antisemitism a while back, but recently was given the go-ahead by the University, uh, Pennsylvania State University, to actually begin uh, fundraising and to really establish the center completely. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say it took 15 years. I, I don't think you, even Yale, could have stretched you out that long. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it's wonderful. I think the more centers of this kind, the better. So, uh, so welcome to a small club, a, a growing club. There's another one in Indiana that's uh, oh. <laughs> Indiana a State University with uh, uh, Alvin Rosenfeld mm -hmm. is coming up online too. They're having a major conference in the spring. Uh, there's also talk in Canada, of, there's one established in Winnipeg recently at the University of Manitoba, and there's talk of one at the University of Toronto, so there's several coming online, and they're, uh, they're needed. So it's, uh, it's a great accomplishment. So today, Professor Rose will be speaking, the title of this talk is Thinking About Antisemitism and Antisemitisms, which I think is a very important uh, distinction. Cultures, emotions, context, and mentalities. Um, professor Rose is the Mitt Randy Professor of History at Pennsylvania State University. He is the Professor of Jewish and European uh, History, Jewish Studies and European History, and the, the Director of this new center, and he's a permanent fellow at the Institute of the Arts and, and Humanities Studies. Uh, professor Rose uh, taught at the University of Haifa, and at the Herzl Institute within the University of Haifa and at York University in Canada. Okay. Okay. He's also taught at the University of Newcastle in Australia, James Cook University in Australia, and he also lectured at Cambridge University at Clare, at, at Clare College, in New York University, St. John's University, the University of Toronto, and the list goes on, and including St. Catherine's College at Oxford. He received his uh, first degree at Oxford University then did an MA stat at Cambridge University, and then he did, did a doctorate in history at uh, Paris, uh, the Sorbonne, and uh, he's also a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He's written many articles and books on issues of anti-Semitism. His latest book was from Oxford University Press entitled Anti-Semitisms, um, and I will leave it there, and welcome <coughs> to Lisa and Yale. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here at this, probably the leading, certainly the leading center of antisemitism studies in America, I think, in North America, including Canada, I guess, you know. Um, uh, some of you may have been at the big conference, the big event in August, and I'm sure you're still remembering that but all too vividly. It's such a change to be at a, a gathering where you were almost preaching to the choir or converted for a change, everyone's more or less on the same page, in different bits of the page, but it was, it was quite an event, and usually you have to sort of defend one, your position about the Middle East or about Jewish history or anti-Semitism, and for once everyone was, you know, started off on the same beginning point of uh, you know, positive sympathies. Um, uh, then they could argue from that, I think. Well, I mean, I got to argue a bit today. Um, uh, I, I posted a sort of draft of something I wrote two or three years ago on the internet um, with this catch-all title, more or less thinking about anti-Semitism. Um, and I'm going to go through a lot of things, uh, touching on and off, and rather grasshopper-like. So if what someone feels offended by something I'm saying, or they just don't understand it, or they're interested in it, or they disagree with it, and want to talk, please do feel free to interrupt. I'm going to speak more or less at random, semi-orderly way about the, the matter. Um, if you've read, looked at the paper, you'll understand a lot of what I'm saying, but there are a lot of concepts which aren't in the paper I'll mention today, which I've had to refine in the last year or two as a result, mainly of working on Islamic antisemitism. The thing I've got to start off with is um, I've been working this huge book for 18 years um, on antisemitisms, plural. It's a comparative history of antisemitism in different cultures, uh, different national uh, cultures, and, and so on, different periods of history, different religions. And it's a, what I call a, a historical approach. Um, 
Then this, it's characterized by, the, well, I'll come to the, the big problem in a moment of anti-Semitism versus anti-Semitism. But it's, it's different from recent histories, or almost any history I know of, in that it uses quite different conceptual categories, um, what I call probably historical categories, to look at the phenomenon of anti-Semitism or anti-Semitisms. Um, Robert Wistrich's book, the, the huge book you've seen, um, which is about a third of the size of my original text, which the editors struggled down from one and a half million words, about 3,000 pages. It's now 1,100 pages and it's still wanting reductions, which I'm probably going to do in the next week or two. Um, but Robert's book, I mean, it's, it's an, I, I think it fulfills an excellent purpose. Um, it's very political. The implications are spelt out, a little too obviously at times, perhaps. But better that than the reverse, which is often the case with other people. Um, the main problem is he, it's what I call an analytical or a, dis no, analytical, a descriptive or narrative history, like so many histories of anti Semitism. It doesn't really get beneath the surface into much deeper problems. I mean, for instance, I mean, why is someone anti-Semitic? Why is a given culture anti-Semitic? If you can see that for a moment, that generality about cultures and anti-Semitic characterizations or essentials, uh, which is an out-of-fashion term nowadays. Um, for instance, what is hatred? I mean, everyone keeps on talking about uh, hate, j hatred of the Jews and all this sort of stuff. Um, every history has got it, every article has got it. But I mean, if you just think about it for a moment, it's hopeless as a category because all the authors fail to break it down, nearly all the authors, I should say, fail to break hatred down into its constituent emotions. It's a whole range of emotions that we describe as hatred. What really is hatred? Is it someone who's foaming at the mouth and out to kill the nearest Jew on the street? Is it someone who's a very quiet dislike of Jews but intense dislike? Is it a casual dislike? I mean, you have to break it down into emotions rather than um, just blanket terms like Jew hatred, and using the German term Judenhass, where you get the English usage of hatred of the Jews, or in Hebrew, Sinat Israel, hatred of Israel an allusion to Jacob in the Bible that Esau's jealousy of Jacob. Well deserved jealousy, one might say. Um, it's a tricky course, uh, So there are all kinds of problems that, I mean, such histories as Roberts or Anthony Julius, um, whom I greatly admire, just do not deal with. Um, and Julius comes close to it because he has to in looking at the quality of sensibility, the feeling in Eliot when he uses these anti-Semitic metaphors, which are quite extraordinary. The, I mean, Eliot has decided to use the most repulsive evocations, resonances he can dig up in literature, and those happen to be anti-Semitic ones. So that's the real reason. It's not because he's a wild hater of Jews that he uses those uh, images in the anti-Semitic poems of the 1920s, I think. I mean, he's anti-Semitic, yes, but he's not radically anti-Semitic, as the images might suggest to you. I mean, if, if Hitler was saying that, then you could say, yes, this is a, Hitler's typical radical anti-Semitism that's coming out in the images. But with Eliot, one has a different range of problems, I think. And again, you have to look at the emotional life of Eliot himself, this realm of sensibility. I use this word sensibility and mentality all the time to get the, the personality, which is, for me is crucial, as well as the culture, the personalities situated. So the, that's my general objection. What I've tried to do in this book is, why it's taken so long, is I've had to go through every culture from scratch, historical culture, including some of my non-expert areas, and become virtually an expert of every one of them to the level of scholarship, of, of full, full scaled excerpts, and that takes a while. I mean, the, the, the Islamic stuff has uh, taken me the last year and a half to understand. I used to think the, I only put it in because the editor wanted something on Islamic anti-Semitism and I thought I'd do that in two weeks out of Bernard Lewis and these other books and of course the wonderful compilation of um, Andrew Boston, which is excellent as a resource. But the problem, you know, for instance with Andrew Boston's book is that it doesn't have a historical sense of context at all. I mean, it's like biblical fundamentalism. You can pull out any quote you want and use it to prove things. I'm very sensitive to this 
critique myself because when I work on Wagner, that's what's thrown at me. But I'm very alert to the context of Wagner. I'm, I'm only going to understand any word uttered by Wagner or any musical note in the general context of his whole thought and feeling, his personality, not in the culture background, not just you know uh, as a, a quotation. You know, uh, the only thing the Jew has to learn to do is die. I mean, that's a big problem. What does die mean? Some people say, oh, it just means you know, physically die. Other people say, no, it's a spiritual trans transformation. You get the same thing with jihad, for instance, in a different culture. I mean, is jihad a spiritual endeavor, or is it a hard edge of a sword enterprise? And um, you have to understand the emotions behind the utterance of jihad, a particular person, the culture, in order to say what it really means. You can't just quote it and say, uh, this, the Arabs are all in favor of murdering the Jews for jihad. It's much more complicated than that. I'm speaking now as a historian. Um, and historians nowadays, the sacred thing is context, not just massive amassment of, amassing of quotations, which all seem to say the same thing, whereas according to the context, they may have quite different meanings. And people who work in Jewish studies understand this very well, biblical studies. I mean, you know, you can't just quote the Torah, the books of Moses, as a principle, as Christians might think we can do as a different culture. Christian fundamentalism and Jewish fundamentalism is quite different. The, the text only has a meaning that has to be pulled out from its interpretation, context, and rabbinical history, the Talmud, and so on. So, you know, the commandment to exterminate the Canaanites, you can't say that as a commandment as anti-Semites do now, to exterminate the, uh, the Palestinians, or something like this say this is the way the Jews think they want to exterminate us. Um, whereas, you know, in rabbinical context, the meaning is clearly the Canaanites have gone, so the commandment to exterminate has lapsed. It doesn't have any validity anymore if you take it in a, in a rabbinical context. Um, I'm, as, you can, as you can see, I'm darting around here with various ideas. Um, for me, they're all connected. It's a web, a continuum of ideas, and you can start at any part of the web and find your way around it. Um, you don't have to start with, you know, say, a pure ideological history of anti-Semitism, where you just, as in, say, Robert's book, you describe what an anti-Semite says about the Jews, you sort of paraphrase it into understandable English, and then you may point out the fallacy involved, and that's it, or the, the nastiness of it. I mean, that's only the surface, from my point of view, what I want to know is what, what is the feeling that's animated this ideology. And here I come to my compatriot, one of my compatriots, great statement, David Hume, that um, reason is the slave of the emotions, um, meaning that you know, most of our rational positions are ideologies, whether it's about tax or unemployment benefits today being extended to one or the other. Um, th those look like rational debates, but they're not really. They're really positions taken and rationalized from an emotional starting point, an emotional instinct, a drive. And I think Freud talked about people being either irrational conservatives or irrational uh, liberals. It's a Gilbert and Sullivan song about are you born a little conservative or a little liberal or something. So we've got this to look at. This is the role of the emotions, and that's what I've dealt with in the book. So coming to a bit more orderly exposition now, what the book uses as its basic categories is, apart from description of anti-Semitism, the ideology, which is the, just the surface, um, the two aspects. One is that every anti-Semitism is conditioned by its culture, as well as by the personality of its individual author, in the case of a text. You can only understand um, a Hitler statement in the context of Austro-German culture plus Hitler's own um, attitudes and personality. Otherwise, if you just use it, um, as some historians do, as an objective text statement, it, it, it's like to be very much under misunderstood, and often underrated in the intensity of its hatred, I think. So that's the first thing, that you, you look at each anti-Semitism in Europe, Euro European or world history, in, in the context of its own culture. Um, the second thing I've used are emotions themselves, looking at the personality, analyzing the exact nature of the hatred, whether it's resentment, social panic, I mean, it's a whole jealousy, envy, paranoia. There's a whole stream of 
particular emotions which one has to identify. And you'll find that in a given text, from sentence to sentence, or even within the same sentence, a given author will flit seamlessly from one to the other. So you're not sure what, which one he's got in mind. In other words, it's a flux, a chaotic flux of emotions. Um, when those uh, memory excerpts were shown at the, the conference by a couple of speakers, I mean, it was, I think a lot of people picked it up in the audience that it was just inchoate ideas, one after the other. The only thing they had in common was a sort of exterior. And it didn't matter about rational truth or anything. They were, the sentences were rationally organized, yes. Sort of um, subjects, predicates, and there were paragraphs even, and logical arguments and ideologies. But all the, um, the only thing that made sense in this flux was an emotion that was driving in a particular Islamic emotion. It's very widespread in Islamic culture, especially nowadays. So my, my key is the emotions plus the cultures. And once you look at those two, you fuse them all together, looking at any given country, you'll begin to understand the antisemitism on a much deeper level than I think is usually available. Um, there are some big problems here. Uh, if you remember Hannah Arendt's material, for instance, you recall that her big point was that antisemitism as such only originates in the with modernity. 18th, 19th, 20th century with the modern man, industrialization, modernization of culture, all the rest of it. Um, her, her concept was anything before that, before anti-Semitism, which led to the Holocaust, anything before that was really sort of anti-Judaism. It wasn't real, really worthy of the title of anti-Semitism. This is a very common attitude nowadays. Um, but I, again, I think it's very fallacious. She reserved her utmost scorn, if you recall, for the term eternal antisemitism. She laughed at it in her books, constantly mocked it. Um, and eternal antisemitism was a term used by Jewish historians who said, look, the Goyim non-Jews always hate us. <laughs> There's no way out of it. This is the Jewish concept of antisemitism, Sinat Israel. You know, it starts off in the Bible with Jacob and Esau and Balak and Balaam. It goes on and on, Pharaoh, and then uh, Ahasuerus, and Haman, and then Maccabees. And it's just one long sequential history of Jew hatred, hatred of Israel, the Jews. Um, well, that's what she disliked, since she was so critical of Jewish culture. She was very perverse, as you know. Um, got carried away by her perversity very often, especially as far as Heidegger was concerned, unfortunately. But she mocked eternal anti-Semitism. But here you can see a problem. A big, the, the big conceptual problem with the history of anti-Semitism. Is there a capital A anti-Semitism, an eternal, universal anti-Semitism which erupts in different periods, in different cultures, but always targeted on the Jews, but always there latently somehow or other? It's an essential mental trait, category, way of thinking, feeling. Or, do we have, as many historians now argue nowadays, just a series, a whole spectrum of anti-Semitisms, that is, products, constructions of individual cultures, periods, and so on. And so there is no essential universal anti-Semitism, no eternal anti-Semitism at all. Well, I mean, from my point of view, this is a false, misconceived question, like so many. I mean, what I try to do is to fuse the two together to show it's a false question. Uh, there are certain aspects, features, which I'm sure represent eternal anti-Semitism. Sometimes it's the techniques, I mean, the obvious techniques we're aware of. For instance, um, projection. You project onto the Jews your own hatred of the other, um, or your own intention to deal harshly with the Jews, and you know, even Hitler and all the rest of them. They're saying the Jews are out to kill us, and so forth. In the Middle Ages, the Christians say the Jews are out to kill us, therefore we must kill the Jews first. Um, so they pre there's no intention of the Jews to kill the Gentiles, obviously. Um, they're suspicious of the Gentiles, they're fearful, they may even dislike the Gentiles. They may even be willing to keep them at arm's length and not be happy at Gentile misfortunes in some cases. But there's certainly no attempt to murder or mistreat the Gentiles at all, or even to cheat them, just ordinary cheat them. Gentiles commercially, that's frowned upon in many rabbinical writings as being worse uh, than cheating a fellow Jew. 
And here we go to the history of the town as it's received in anti-Semitic mentalities. Um, right to the present day, I think, pull out things. I mean, even the Protocols of Zion is a secularized version of the old anti-Talmud, anti-Semitic arguments, namely that the Jews have a conspiracy to dominate the non-Jews, that they're able to uh, cheat, they're able to murder the Jews, and it's, uh, the Talmudic quotations are either pulled out of context, sometimes they're rebutted in the Talmud itself, or um, sometimes they're just outright falsified. Hitler's earliest publication in 1924, sort of publication, is Dialogue with Eckhart, and it rages on and on about the Talmud, and you find it constantly coming through, right to the present moment, even in the Islamic material. Um, I've been doing a book on this for many years, the tandem of the big anti-Semitism book. And, uh, I was struck how the two things merged together, the whole history of anti-Semitism and the anti-Talmud. Um, you get it in Luther, I mean, it goes on and on about the Talmud, and the, the mistreatment of Gentiles by Jews legitimized by the Talmud, and so on. Um, that's a purely emotional suspicion of the other, of course. Uh, Again, one has to analyze it not so much in intellectual terms, but in emotional, psychological terms. Some of what I'm saying might ring a bell. You might say, what about Adorno's authoritarian personality? And that is one wonderful treatment of antisemitism from the point of view of a history of emotions. It really is a masterpiece. But being a sociologist, I apologize to sociologists here, um, you know, it's, it's one dimensional, it's too static, I think. It's not just a sense of historical development in context, but it's a wonderful collection of case histories of emotions. I mean, the only thing that links all these case histories is the pure emotionality of the individual, whether you call it paranoia, resentment, or hysteria, panic, whatever you want to call it. And sometimes envy, greed, um, distrust, authoritarianism, and all these emotional qualities that you find in the Adorno authoritarian personality. It's a wonderful book. And I've exploited it to the fullest, um, not the individual cases, but the personalities, types that you find there. Again, you find it described in a way, this emotional approach in Sartre. Um, as you remember, in the Semite and Jew, Sartre, it has its problems, the book. But he has a wonderful portrait of the typical anti Semite, you might remember, as a person of raging emotion and paranoia. And, Inferiority, and so does Nietzsche come to think of it, but not as well worked out as Sartre. But of course, Sartre is actually talking about Celine, the novelist, who was a classic case of the hysterical anti Semite, um, where the emotions are brought up right to the surface without any camouflage, any rationalization. It doesn't rationalize the Jews are trying to drag us into a war, so we must exterminate them first. It does rationalize it, Celine to that extent. But I think Sartre grasped the, the emotion, but he never pursued it systematically, of course. It was just a, a in passing a job, I think, it certainly. Well, having talked about too much theory, um, let me uh, get something a bit more concrete. Look at Voltaire to illustrate something. Um, Voltaire's very complicated individual. He's a personality. He's not going to yield all his secrets to anyone. I mean, he's, he covers up his tracks too well. He contradicts himself. He uses all these typical um, resorts of uh, in intricate personality. This is this famous letter replying to a Portuguese Amsterdam Jew, a admirer of his, who complained about uh, his usual writing about the Jews. And of course, when Voltaire talks about the Jews, he loses all rationalization ability. He, you know, he accuses the Jews of sodomy with animals, of murdering hordes, unheard of hordes of people more than any other race on earth, carrying out human sacrifice, uh, the women having intercourse with goats. I mean, all this, these are absolutely insane charges. And if anyone else had uttered them, Voltaire would have ripped them to pieces as you know, the example of infamy and so forth. But he's unembarrassed himself. To keep on on, he cannot stop himself. It's quite clear to read Voltaire, the originals. He just cannot stop. The style runs away with him. Um, well, this is this letter of apology. The lines you complain of are violent and unjust. There are among you enlightened men worthy of respect. I was wrong to attribute to a whole nation the vices of some individuals. Well, that's the same rational voice of reason 
will tell you, you'll know that violin is joy. But then, look, there's no break. Immediately, he says, there comes a hammer, the emotional hammer. I will say to you with the same frankness that many people, maybe himself, of course, cannot tolerate your laws, your books, or your superstitions. I mean, there's just no quarter given there. This is an outright attack. There's no differentiation of mood, of intellect, of, of thought there at all, of analysis. They say your nation has at all times done much harm to itself and to the human race. Notice that. It's, the whole human race here is being attacked by the Jews. Superstition, which is the key vice of the Jews, is the most abominable scourge of the world and causes um, you know, the slaughter of so many Jews and Christians and sends you Jews even now to the state. You're being punished yourself. Your own chickens are coming home to roost, your own superstition, um, which you've imparted to the Christians. And Wagner it says exactly the same thing, and of course, Nietzsche, and that's like the more restrained version, the way he does as well. But then he comes to this cryptic remark. Again, he seems to be returning to reason, rationality. The emotion is cool. Remain a Jew since you are one. But be a philosopher, that's the best I can wish you in this short life. Well, that's not so rational and calm and cool as it looks. You know, understand how Voltaire thinks and feels. Um, to be a philosopher means to destroy Jewish identity. I mean, there's nothing, if you become a philosopher, there's nothing left to remain a Jew. Yes, you remain a Jew, you keep a Jewish name, perhaps even describe yourself as Jew by religion or descent. But this is not Jewish identity in any real sense of the word that's left once you become a philosopher according to Voltaire's lines. So there's a nasty philosophical, uh, emotional demand, blackmail being urged here, which masquerades under the line of reason. Um, the problem, of course, is that Voltaire himself would never have persecuted the Jews. I mean, he was inhibited by too many counter emotions and ideas in his own personality and thought to do it. And French culture was different, it was unique. And there was a great deal of protest within France, even with the Catholic Church, to his anti Semitic remarks. And as well as among fellow philosophers like Diderot, who just said, You're going too far, you know, a bit of uh, distrust and dislike of the Jews is okay, but this is wild. That's Diderot telling him off. But the problem arises when it is transferred to, translated into German culture. And these anti-Semitic remarks, and lots of others of Voltaire, enjoy a tremendous popularity in Germany, in Germany, in the late 18th, 19th century, right up to Hitler. Everyone knows that was educated, or not even educated. Um, Goethe could quote them, everyone, all the serious people know them. Um, Fichte, Fichte. This is um, <coughs> one of the key texts <coughs> of modern anti-Semitic mentality, especially in Germany. Um, and it's published in 1793. Fichte, as you know, is a highly rational, idealist philosopher, technically speaking. And he's regarded as a bit of a revolutionary a radical in the 1790s, and he's the man who, uh, when trying to popularize the writings of his mentor, Kant, um, enraged Kant to such an extent that Kant said, God save me from my friends. And he said, I'll take care of my enemies by myself. Um, so he's a bit of a loose cannon, but he's a colossal influence. Of course, later on, he's the spokesman for the German liberation movement against the Napoleonic occupation of Germany and so on, the addresses to the German nation, which do not mention Jews at all in the addresses, 1806. But the Jewish element is always there. It's always the, underneath the text, just as it is in a Hitler speech, which may not really mention Jews, but the Jews are the hidden presence there. They have to be there. They're logically entailed because of what is being said in a positive way. The Jews are the negative side of it. Uh, this is an amazing thing. It's a 400-page book. And suddenly, in the middle of it, absolutely nowhere, there comes this. I, I numbered the sentences. Let's, let's, let's look at this. A powerful, hostile, and disposed nation is infiltrating almost every country in Europe. This nation is in a state of perpetual war with all these countries. Now, if someone off the street who's a lunatic anti Semite says this, you wouldn't be surprised. But this is a rational philosopher, an educated man of the first rank saying it. And he has no inhibitions, no miscompunctions about this 
idiotic statement. I mean, anyone, even an anti-Semite, a reasonable anti-Semite, could see for a moment that you know this is just rubbish. It's not a threat to this extent. This is wild emotion speaking. It's paranoia. So what looks like a rational statement is, in fact, deeply emotion, pure emotion. The Jewish nation is so dreadful, not because it's isolated and close-knit, rather because it's founded on the hatred of humanity, mankind, Menschheit, is the word he uses. But, uh, I use humanity then to change a little bit vocabulary of German culture in this period. Um, well, you'll recognize, of course, this is an old theme. It's an old cultural theme going back to Tacitus. The Jews are separate themselves from us by food and customs and habits, and they are animated by the hatred of all humanity. It's the mani generis, the human race in Tacitus. And everyone knows that. And it's quoted here, obviously, being cited. But the problem is, and I think it's also present in Tacitus, but not to the same emotional intensity. The problem is this is you know, a radical statement. If you say that, as many of the books, textbooks say, that you know, anti-Semitism originates with Christianity, a demonic concept, the emotional concept of demonizing the Jews is a Christian invention. Well, all you have to do is point out the Tacitus attitude to the Jews and lots of other you know, Hellenistic comments on the Jews, which are quite hysterical, not to mention the Alexandrian pogrom, which is uncannily described like a modern Russian pogrom in you know, the 1840s. It's an astonishing, you can give this to a student and say, where does this description of the Alexandrian pogrom come from? And they'll say it's Russia in the 1890s, uh, 1905, 1906. Um, and that's an aspect, again, of eternal antisemitism. We get this recurrence of techniques, whether they're ideas or whether they're measures or ways of dealing with the Jews, the actual technical measures, the physical measures. Um, but here, it's, it's quite intense. <coughs> what is it to say your, your people, your religion, hates the rest of the human race? I mean, we're so used to seeing this. Water off our backs, isn't it? I mean, not to pay attention to it. You think for a moment, I mean, it really is a monstrous allegation. <coughs> Crucifying Jesus and all the which is a much more intense thing because then you're the enemy of God as well as the enemy of all the human beings in the Christian. But it's a matter of degree, I think, not of kind. Um, it's, it's really an incredibly nasty, vile, emotional driven statement. And then he explains it condemned itself and is condemned to petty trade and so forth. And then he goes on to say the Jews, well, let's read it. Um, you know, the Jewish nation, this is all sentimental, quabbling around the place. It's, it's really disgusting and funny, actually. Number four, the Jewish nation excluded itself from our meals, festive toasts, sweet heart-to-heart -heart exchanges of happiness by the most binding element of humanity, religion. It separates itself <coughs> from all others and students and rights from here until eternity. The Jews will never, can never change. So we don't need a biological explanation of immutable Jewish nasty character. Just the Jews create their own nasty character for eternity. It's, this is what I call proto-racism. We don't have the full biological stuff until the 1860s, 1870s, of course. But then immediately, after this, what you could call rational, or more of a comparatively rational statement, justification for anti-Semitism, he says, look at the tone. One would expect something different from such a people than what we see. Namely, that in a state where the absolute monarch may not take, take away you know, confiscate my ancestral dwelling, where I retain my rights before your powerful royal ministers, the first Jew whom it so pleases pillages that which is mine and goes unpunished. You see all this, it cannot be denied. Now, I mean, this is not a reasonable argument. I mean, for, especially for an academic philosopher. It's wild, it's ungoverned, it's pure passion coming out here. And there's no pretense of trying to rein it in any longer. He simply cannot help himself. This is not intellectual discussion at all. And anyone who's thought for a moment at that time, any acquaintance of his, would have said, look, of course it's rubbish. You know, of course the Jews are not able to pillage me in the street or pillage me from my house or whatever. It's a wild emotional charge. And then he says, number six, you know, those of you who want to emancipate the Jews, 
doesn't it occur to you that the Jews are citizens of a state more secure and powerful than any of yours? Um, in other words, it's the Jewish international conspiracy in a state within a state, and so on. So these are old established ideas, a state within a state is an old story that dates back actually to the 16th century French wars of religion, where the Protestants were called a state within a state by the Catholic regime, but here it's applied to the Jews. So it's an old concept on an ideological level, but what is striking is the fact that the bogey of the Jewish international state, which is more powerful than any European state, is, is obsessing him. It is truly emotional. Then there's this wonderful footnote. What time is it? I don't want to go on. I'll try to wind it up in a couple of minutes. Um, let the poisonous air of intolerance stick as far from these pages as it is from my heart. This is the usual affectation of human humanity and uh, brotherhood and so on, and pure humanity in general. He who overcomes the difficult, insurmountable barriers which lie before him, the Jew, who entertains a love of justice, humanity, and truth, that Jew is a hero and a saint. I don't know whether such Jews existed ever or exist today, I believe, when I meet such Jews. Well, it's charming, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> it's very debonair and it's elegant. But I mean, it's again a monstrous statement, absolutely monstrous. He's saying the Jews are not full human beings. He says that most human beings, nearly all human beings, unless they're all wicked ones or crazy ones, you know, have a natural love of justice, humanity, and truth, even if they don't always practice it. <laughs> but at least they've got the natural law within them, you know, as in Kant. You know in a moral law, it's a human phenomenon. But here he's saying they don't have this Kant, Kantian inner imperative moral categorization. Um, he's saying they're not human beings. And so here we get the beginning of this concept that Jews are not human. And of course, once you go much later, you have all the ideological paraphernalia developed and the racial instincts and the politics and the sloganizing. Then you get the Jews as subhuman in the Holocaust. But this is the, the emotional basis, foundation of the whole way of thinking and feeling, the whole mentality that leads to the Holocaust. They must have known, must have human rights, even though we will not grant them to us. Well, that means just the Jews are allowed to eat and scrape a living, maybe, if we let them. It doesn't mean they're allowed to live in houses. It, it doesn't mean that they have civil rights of ownership or anything like that, of course. Still, and this is the key, everyone knows this in German culture, used to. Still, I see absolutely no way of giving them civil rights except if we one night chop off all their heads and replace them with new ones, in which there would be not one single Jewish idea. I said, well, is he physically saying we want to chop off the Jewish heads? Of course not. It's, it's a joke. And this is one of the prime characteristics of anti especially German, but most anti-Semitism. This ambivalence, this ambiguity about metaphor spirituality or figurative language and real physical practice and policy. Now, of course, here he can see no way. It's still unthinkable in the Enlightenment, which is part of, to start mass murdering people, Jews. But there's a sort of, if only, it's, it's a latent thing. You get it in Wagner, by the way, explained explicitly. Um, so it's, he would say it's a joke. And jokes, of course, are keys to the emotion. You don't have to be a Freudian to believe that. We all sense it as we get older. You know, there's, there's no real innocent joke. It's always revealing some hidden preoccupation. So it's a wonderful way of looking at the jokes, even Hitler's jokes, of getting into their true emotions. Um, so that's another category I use, the ambivalence of metaphor and physicality. And you get it right through the German stuff in the 19th century, this extermination of fantasy life that they have. They're all talking about it. You're astonished right through the 19th century. Hitler himself uses the same language in his early speeches, his early writings, and, and then of course in his later speeches. They're also on the you know, the prophecy, you know, it's not the end. If, it's, if they bring about another war, it will not be the Jewish victory, it will be the disappearance, the finitude of the Jewish um, presence in Europe. What does he mean by Fernicto? Well, disappearance, they'll sort of vanish somehow or other. They'll just leave and pack and take the next train out. Um, what does he mean? Something more violent. Expulsion followed by extermination. So fantasies are crucial 
for understanding it, the emotional life of anti-Semitism and the Semites and the whole development of the policy. I'm not going to go on much more because this is this, there's so many ideas here and something might come out of the discussion. I just want to show you two minutes of Wagner to show you how, how he impregnates not only into the drama, into the language, into the characters of the opera. So this is a long preoccupation of mine. The, the work I do now is on the actual music, the notes, the orchestration, where he imitates, he parodies Meyerbeer, the Jewish composer, for example, and he develops very often um, parodies of Jewish klezmer style, Jewish lullabies, as he imagines them very often from a certain book, which is anti-Semitic, a collection of Jewish Yiddish songs in the bestseller in the 1840s and 50s. And he knows about this, and he, he exploits it. So um, the, I mean, the actual technical musicality, the musical devices he uses are the Phrygian mode, used with a combination of a, minor, a Western minor scale, and you get a funny effect, plus the direct imitation of bel canto from the Mayabir operas and the orchestration. He doubles up the cellos with the voice very often when he's in a parodying Jews in the operas musically. And this is something he never does when it's a normal heroic character on the stage. It's only when there's a Jewish allegorical personality that he'll use the, the doubling of the cellos and so on. He uses it, for instance, in the, the lovely opening duets, uh, the Rhine Maidens in Rheingold between Albrecht and the Rhine Maidens, where the three of them have a duet in turn with Albrecht and uh, you know, the voices follow a certain pattern doubled by the cellos. The bit is here is from Siegfried, which Mahler said was the most wonderful anti-Semitic opera of all. He said, <laughs> he said it's so cunningly suggested, the anti-Semitism, musically as well as textually and dramatically and philosophically. Uh, he said, if I were to conduct it for you properly, I'd show you what I, how, how it comes out. And so then uh, Mahler says, Mima is me, basically, the Jew in this opera. So a lot of my work is trying to bring out this Malerian analysis of the anti-Semitism in the music itself, as well as the obvious uh, characterization of language in all the operas. Um, let's just look at this. this. This is where finally Siegfried has his eyes open and understands the true words spoken by the Jews who are trying to seduce him, exploit him, control him, and of course, allegorically, Wagner, Germany itself. Um, and he's, you know, finally, the only way to deal with them is to kill them. As you well, metaphorically, dramatically on stage, Siegfried murders Mima um, after Mima's come out despite himself with his true intentions. So can we try number two? Oh, oh wait. <laughs> Das sagt es doch nicht. 
in the Phrygian mode now. Let's go. You don't actually see the murder. But it, it, you can see how dense it is. How, see, Wagner could never resist showing off. It's, uh, this is just 30 seconds. I repeat it. When he says, you and all your kind I hate, meaning the Germans. That's emotionally how Wagner sees the Jews. Now, when I say a lot of these things are just techniques projecting stuff onto the Jews, blaming the Jews for anti-Semitism, it's the Jews' fault. It doesn't mean that they're just using them as excuses or pretexts. They really do believe these things that they project and that they blame the Jews. It's, it's absolutely unmistakable because um, that's their emotional universe. And this is Wagner's emotional universe about the Jews. I mean, to analyze his ideology about the Jews is pretty pointless, I think. I've learned it so many years. I mean, unless you understand how you get inside his head and his realm of feeling, and then you can get it, and then you can relate it to German culture, sitting in the context and look for the similar emotions in German culture. Um, the only other thing I should say is one of the key concepts I've been using of late is that of the moral economy, some of you might have heard of. This is something that was invented, I conceive, I think, by, for quite different reasons by the English historian E.P. Thompson in the 70s mm -hmm. to try and explain why people say the Middle Ages you know, they, they regarded the economy as moral. You know, peasants did this, and townspeople did this, and nobility did this, and kings did this, and everything was right in God's heaven, basically. The economy was a, a moral entity. Nowadays, we have different ideas. We think there should be a bit fairer distribution of wealth, so that is our new <coughs> moral economy. But if you look at Eastern Europe in particular, in the late 19th, the Grand Period, forget in Germany, in the 20th century, you'll see that the moral economy explores a lot of a distance, and some people have done this already, to explaining the mass murders of Jews and the collusion by various East European populations with the, the Germans during the Holocaust, or even before the Holocaust in 1918 to 1922 or so. You know, it's a very intense uh, situation you get in Eastern Europe of, of ethnic massacres. Um, and a lot of it is because people see the economy changing, and Jews are taking new ro roles, and the peasants don't have the roles they used to have, say, in Poland in the earlier 19th century. So there is a sense of the moral economy being turned upside down, and the Jews are seen as being at the forefront of this transformation. And of course, it's, it's an emotional reaction. Your whole world is shattered, and you're going to react emotionally. You may have a reason, you may say, oh, the Jews are Bolsheviks, or the Jews are taking over our trade. Well, that's the rational. Um, description, excuse, pretext, or analysis. But of course, what's driving that? Because really what drives all these things is the emotion. Thus, when you decide to be reasonable, to uh, uh, take a reasonable analysis of some in phenomenon, rather, you could say that's being reasonable. That's stronger than emotion. But no, your decision to be reasonable is an emotional decision in the first place. Then you decide to be reasonable. And lastly, anti-Semitic cultures. Everyone in medieval Europe was an anti-Semite because they were born into an anti-Semitic culture. I mean, by everyone in inverted commas. Um, everyone in Nazi Germany was an anti-Semite because Germany from 1933 was anti-Semitized. You, you grew up in the culture just as you would as a medieval Christian, absorbed Christian anti-Semitism. Now, if you don't have the personality, the emotional profile, that goes along with this, eventually you'll become skeptical, you'll grow out of it, you may reject it in the first place. You'll say, hang on, look at this reasonably, well, civilized, in a civilized way, emotionally, with compassion, and you'll, you'll be resistant. People will resist it. But the, the culture itself, though those are the more reasonable people in humanity, in the human race, but for an ordinary person, it's very difficult to resist the acculturation of anti-Semitism, if you've grown up in it. Um, my favorite text is Matthew 27, is blood be upon our heads and those of our children. Now, I have many Christian friends who can read this, and it doesn't affect them, it doesn't trigger them emotionally at all. They think it's a metaphor. Well, even 
No, Gibson thought it was a, it was a spiritual statement. It's half genuine, I think. It's a strange case. But you can show to someone, to a Japanese who's never known a Christian idea, and instantly, perhaps, that particular Japanese will be transformed emotionally into an anti-Semite. It, it triggers the profile right away. Um, so we, we're dealing with human types, individualities, and not entirely with cultures. People can be resistant to a culture. And that's the best prospect, I think, uh, for our, the, uh, the initiatives of preoccupation with Islamic anti-Semitism, which is now